Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on demand. And while we won't be doing a live question and answer period during today's broadcast, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please, you can still go ahead and use that GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many questions, well, I, I'm sorry, they will actually get to your questions offline uh, following today's webinar. Also, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our big lucky winners. All right. We have uh, a great webinar, as I said. Um, our webinar topic today, sorry, is more than monitoring how observability takes you from firefighting to fire prevention, presented by Splunk. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar. Jade, take it away, please. Hello, and welcome to this uh, DevOps.com and Splunk uh, webinar about uh, monitoring. Today, we're going to talk about observability and how you can move your uh, troubleshooting strategy from firefighting into something that is more fire prevention. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm Stefan Esteves and I'm the observability evangelist in EMEA at Splunk. As you can hear, I have a French accent and there's nothing that can, I can do about it. I'm sorry for that, uh, but that's not important. What is important is the topic of today. Uh, just some housekeeping items, uh, a forward look at statement. You can still have time to read it a little bit uh, back later in, uh, because uh, this will be available also on demand. So let's, let's start with the agenda. Uh, as an introduction, I would like to just to redefine what observability is, because there is a lot of noise, I would say, around observability and the way we think observability should be addressed. See some use, classic use cases of uh, observability and how observability help to enhance monitoring, but maybe not replace monitoring. Uh, after that, one of my colleagues will do a, a, a demo, uh, so you can see how observability works in Splunk environment. And uh, I will take at the end a few minutes to expand uh, the view of observability and how observability will interact with your uh, artificial intelligence for operations strategy with your AI ops. And just to conclude a few words about Splunk. So what is observability? I mean, and, and first, why are we talking about observability? It's because our reality is changing. Uh, we adopting new ephemeral technologies microservices, containers, serverless, and so on. And uh, this is creating really new challenges when we talk about incident management and so on. And this is a very old uh, tweet, but it, because it has five years now, but it's still very valid. And uh, as people is adopting this new highly distributed environments with microservices and so on, um, when they try to investigate about an incident, it's like a murder mystery. Uh, it's really, really complicated. So that's why you need observability. But to understand it, you need to understand the mindset. Uh, even about, it's not about talking of definition, it's you need to understand the concept of, of observability. And for that, I like to use um, uh, the survivor bias as an example. And during the previous world war, um, the, the engineers were working on how to improve the planes. Um, and, and so they were looking into the planes that were coming back and say, okay, here is where the impacts are, so we should, improve the plane in these areas, which sounds very logical, right? Makes sense. It's I'm seeing really the impacts, so this is where I should focus my attention. And that's what we have been doing for decades in monitoring. It's looking for stuff that we know is going to fail. But what happened is then a statistician called Abram Wall say, guys, talking to the engineers, uh, you're making a, a logical error here. Uh, you're focusing on what you're seeing. And in fact, you should focus on what you, you're not seeing which means the plane that didn't made it, the, the ones that didn't return. So instead, you should focus your attention to improve the other areas of your plane. Why? Because in fact, 
uh, we made this mistake because the, the, the uh, shutdown aircraft really didn't exter externalize. So you see, that's difficult for French. It's states, right? So it's looking for stuff that you don't see because that's what is really impacting your IT, your service, your application. So observability, again, another way of seeing it, it's, it's, it's a noun, right? It's something that you have, it's a property of your system, of your application and so on. While when we talk about monitoring, this is a verb, which means an action, it's something that you do to determine the state of your system and application. So if you have observability, then you can do a better monitoring and then analyze uh, the data and act on it, right? So you need to make sure that your application, your systems, your cloud are observable. Do you get the right data? Does uh, your code and your developers uh, have created your application in a way that it can externalize its state? Does your monitoring tools can access the right data? So making sure that um, your system is available, is observable, so you can properly monitor it. That's the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves. Why? Because as I say in the introduction, our world is changing. We, with digital transformation accelerating with a new reality, uh, this means that we're going more into cloud, that uh, DevOps initiatives are uh, more and more important. Um, and we end up in this situation when every company is slightly different. We have different levels of maturity when we talk about our cloud native journey. Um, some are still not really going into the cloud, right? Still retaining and optimizing what they have in-house, but then others are moving into lift and shift, which is how can I start using the flexibility of the cloud, but mainly for um, the abstracting the hardware. So going to infra infrastructure as a service, but still keeping my application kind of in a monolithic way. Uh, others are refactoring the applications. How can I not only use the agility and the flexibility of the cloud for the infra underlying infrastructure, but also for the, some of the applications layers and others, usually more startups or the brand new applications on, on bigger companies are completely doing a re-architecture or building a cloud native application created for the cloud in the cloud. And sometimes when you are a big company, you have some applications in different stages, right? So that's very complicated to understand. Um, so you need to add this observability as you move in toward cloud and being more cloud native. Because again, this is not about replacing monitoring. This is about working and enhancing monitoring because monitoring is still valid, right? You we still need to keep an eye on things that we know uh, can go wrong. But with observability, we need to change our mindset and really search for what is unexpected, what um, uh, find all the evidence of what happened and make sure that we have the right tool set for that. And that's one of the key issues because on DevOps approaches, we spend a lot of time in CI, CD and working in tooling or the process to deliver the code, but very often um, we left behind all the monitoring tools and how we not only monitor uh, the cloud, but our transactions may start in the cloud, but sometimes can end up in an SAP system, in a mainframe or whatever in the back end. And when we talk about monitoring and observability, it's an end to end approach that we need to have. So basically what the market is saying is observability, it's about um, you know, finding the unknowns and it's based on three pillars. That's the classic accepted, I would say definition. Um, to be honest, at Splunk, we think there's more pillars than just three. It's uh, as many as that as data sets that make sense to, to collect. But anyway, uh, it's metric, traces, and logs. And you need uh, to really make sure that not only you monitor properly, because all your strategy on the back end starts with monitoring and alerting, because from there, you identify an incident, then you start investigating, doing some correlation. Uh, and as you're growing, as there is more events, as there's more information to process, you go into AI ops. You need to get the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning so you can also then enhance your incident response and add some automation. But as the new reality is meaning that everything is more distributed and ephemeral, you need to make sure that you get observability, that you um, you get the right data, the right speed, at the right volume from logs, metrics, and traces all together. So all the rest of the process can be enhanced as well. So what is required 
for observability. As I said, first is getting all the data. Again, having a tool that monitors the system every minute is no longer uh, the norm. Why? Because between one, one take in one minute and one minute after, in the middle, anything can happen. Uh, a container can be created or microservices can be launched. There can be a, an issue, be rebooted and so on. And, and you have no idea. Your system is saying everything is fine because it's taking everyone a minute, but uh, microservices take a few minutes, seconds to start, right? So an entire world can happen between a, in just one minute time frame. So you need to make sure you can capture all this data. And you do that in real time and in a scal scalable way, because on average, um, most companies have more than seven different on-premises, private and public clouds, right? So that's huge in terms of volume as well. And because it's huge in terms of volume, now it, it's something that humans cannot consume anymore. So you need to get the help of machine learning because now you can process this information at CPU speed thanks to the algorithms. And the idea is not to be a data scientist, but use a technology that will that you can configure to help you in your daily job. The ultimate goal is obviously to improve the customer experience, uh, the, the, the release quality and velocity of the applications, the efficiency of the development process, and so on. So what are the key use cases of observability? And I, I think you already kind of guessed uh, the, the use cases. The first one, obviously, is cloud migration, right? Hybrid cloud monitoring, cost control as well, and capacity planning is not only about incidents. When you get the data, it's also getting the data related to cost and capacity. Uh, more and more, it's about multi-cloud and hybrid multi-cloud monitoring. How do I monitor AWS, um, GCP, my private cloud, and so on, with all the underlying technologies like Kubernetes and containers and serverless and so on, right? and getting the right KPIs for that? APM is another use case because, again, there is changes in the technologies we, we're using. And that case is microservices, for instance, which is really very complex to monitor and troubleshoot. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, incident response is one of the uh, use cases. So how do we do observability uh, at Splunk and how we can help with observability? Our own definition of observability is it means that you have the data that you need. Again, log metrics, traces, and any data sets that make sense. But for every single unit of work that is of interest to the business, right? The idea is, again, we are in this acceleration of the digital transformation. And the link between DevOps and business needs to be even more uh, integrated. And, that, and that's not easy, easy to do. I mean, if you think about, let's, let's imagine only AWS. Look at how many, I mean, sources of metrics, logs, and, and so on that you have. And that's only AWS. But then you need to add GCP. You need to add Azure. You need to add uh, OpenShift. You need to add your own on-premises uh, infrastructures and so on. So you multiply by X. That's, that's huge. And at the end, the consequence is that all the different teams that should work together, I basically look into their own screens and their own uh, monitoring tools and so on. So they even talk the different languages. And we, we end up always in this war room. And in France, we used to call um, a, a side effect the watermelon effect. And I think the other countries are also using it in, in data centers. And basically, the idea of the watermelon effect is that we work in silos. We use silo tools. And at the end, everybody's looking to their own tool and say, no, network seems OK. My, my, my watermelon is green, uh, looking from the outside. Uh, DBA will say, no, database is fine, green. But when you start digging into get observability from the inside, you find out that, in fact, it's red. And that's the, the watermelon effect. So you can, you can decide to build your own observability platform, right? Um, there is many different tools available. But that's a huge uh, and complex project. And that requires then a lot of maintenance afterwards. And that requires a lot of integrations. Uh, integrations not only to collect the data, but integration with the rest of your um, uh, tool sets to process the incidents and the problems. Uh, in, uh, again, uh, response uh, tools, uh, alerting and events analytics, and these kind of things. So at Splunk, what we do basically is in one solution, it's collecting anything you need. 
in terms of data source, I will come back to that in, in a minute, but it's any data, any volume, any format, any location, right? Can be in the cloud, on premises, whatever. Getting the metrics, the traces, and the logs, and anything else, configs, tickets with integration with ServiceNow, or any other tool that you might want to have, changes, and then contribute to the other aspects of your process. And very recently, uh, only a few days ago, we announced that we added to our tool set uh, real user monitoring, for instance. But we also have on-call uh, solution, automation. And it's like a Lego. You can, you can pick uh, all the tools or some of them, but still have one unique experience. The idea of, with metrics, then you know what is happening. With the traces, you know where it is happening. With logs and tickets and configs and so on, you know why it is happening. Who is impacted with the real user monitoring? Who should I call with the on-call? And then relax a little bit with automation and orchestration. And because of volume of events and, and incidents, let a little bit technology help you so you can save time to do something that is uh, more important. So just a few differentiators on the, um, the Splunk platform. The first one, it's connecting the data with the platform. We are data platform before anything else. And what is unique is that we have more than 2,000 integrations, right? So we can collect data from your existing tools, so you don't have to replace them, but enhance, augment them uh, to your existing uh, network uh, uh, tool, uh, APM, whatever, or you can use us as uh, the monitoring tool. <coughs> Sorry, to onboard all the data. Again, many apps, free apps that can directly collect the data create predefined uh, dashboards for free and so on. Then when we get the metrics, we use streaming technology. We're talking about real time here. Uh, so you need to have a streaming technology and scalable uh, in order to make sure that you get the metrics in real time. That's the new requirement for observability. In terms of tracing, you need also the full fidelity of tracing, right? We don't do sampling like many other uh, APM tools. We take every single trace uh, up to the most smaller detail. And by the way, we also using open store that uh, like open telemetry uh, as an open source project. And Splunk is the uh, major contributor of open telemetry. Logs, I mean, we known for, for uh, leading the market of logs analysis for, for many years. So we, in terms of volume, we can go small to customers that now ingest uh, more, uh, more than 10 petabytes a day of logs. So, uh, it can scale huge uh, or start very small. And events, why having different event analytics? You can group all the events into Splunk and then apply machine learning because um, this is where you get a huge benefit to clean the noise, save time from your teams and fatigue and so on. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Real user monitoring makes sense because again, we, we announce a lot of our tracing technology and we help that to move from back end now to front end and know exactly what's going on with every single transaction. For on call, Splunk on call has been designed for the new reality of everybody now is working remotely. Virtual raw room, raw rooms, again, difficult word for French accent, uh, chat ops and so on. So the idea is to go more for blameless incident management with a mobile first incident response tool using artificial intelligence. And last but not least, getting the possibility to get orchestration and automation so you can build your own uh, playbooks with a visual editor so you can decide which actions you want the technology to take um, and do it for you so you can uh, spend more time in something that requires more expertise. And all this has been grouped into a new observability suite uh, that again, we just announced so you are among the first ones to, to see it, where you get this kind of uh, full view of digital experience monitoring, so real user monitoring, APM, down to the infrastructure, digging into the logs, and then get the incident response and, and on call, all based in the same data platform with these, again, differentiators, the full fidelity approach for every single transaction, the stream real-time streaming, uh, highly scalable, and all the components of machine learning and, um, and artificial intelligence that is configurable. So you don't need to be a data scientist. 
if you do have data scientists, we'd even have a, a toolkit for them so they can bring their own algos and play with the data, but they don't have to deal with the complexity of getting data in, which is usually complex. But if you don't, it's, it's out of the box also available. So now it's time for the demo, and I will let uh, my colleague talk about this um, experience. Um, it's the story of Jenny. Jenny, uh, she's a necessary. She's uh, taking care of a retail uh, e-commerce application. And let's see how this works with uh, Splunk. So in this scenario, Jenny, the SRE on call, gets paged. Jenny knows the alert is worth paying attention to, as all of her alerts are backed by the reliable and intelligent analytics of the Splunk real-time metrics platform. She can quickly see the details and get a preview of what's going wrong with one-click access on her mobile app. This alert shows that the number of purchases in the past hour has dropped and the checkout completion rate is abnormally low. Since the alert logic factors in the time and day of week as a dynamic baseline, Jenny knows the alert is worth paying attention to. To investigate further, she logs into the Splunk observability suite from her laptop. She wants to begin by first understanding the impact of this alert on the users. So she goes into the real user monitoring view to see if there are any clues about the problems that have occurred on the front end in the web app. Here, she notices two issues that may be related to the checkout problems, a spike in the number of front end JavaScript errors and high backend latency. However, it is not clear at this stage if the two are related, nor whether one is causing the, the problems. So she starts by taking a look at the endpoint latency. Here, she observes that the latency for slash cart slash checkout is huge. Jenny decides to investigate further by clicking into it. On the right-hand panel, she sees that there indeed have been some spikes and that they're related to the fetch operation. Clicking into one of the exemplar traces shows that the latency is, isn't a front-end problem, but needs to be traced into the back-end. Luckily, with the tight integration between Splunk RUM and Splunk APM, Jenny can click on the APM link to preview what is available to her. She could even follow through the trace because she has access to full fidelity trace data with Splunk observability. To verify this isn't just an outlier, Jenny clicks on the workflow link to see the aggregate behavior for this important transaction in their system. The performance issue that Jenny sees associated with the user action leads her to look at the full set of services backing the checkout action in APM. By just looking at the service map, she identifies that both the payment service and the data store that backs the card service, Galactus Postgres 98321, have errors that are identified by the system as root cause errors. In other words, the services with the most downstream errors contributing to a degraded experience. So switching to the Splunk on-call incident war room, she adds both the cart and the payment service teams to the incident in addition to the SRE team that she's a part of. Since Splunk on-call handles all on-call schedules, she doesn't have to worry about which team member the alert is going to. Someone on the team will get paged. This brings Sarah, the card service owner, and Andrew, the payment service owner, into the incident, and they both are going to look at their respective services. Sarah starts by keying in on Galactus Postgres 98321 in the service map. Since this Postgres data store, which runs on Kubernetes, backs multiple other services, it's important to determine if there are any other correlated errors. So she clicks on the service and navigates to the bottom of the page to view additional information related to the service, like what infrastructure it runs on, what alerts it has, and if there are any error logs associated with it. Sarah clicks on the first link in order to eliminate infrastructure problems as a source of issues. Here, she doesn't notice anything out of the ordinary. There was a code push, and so the pods running this service are relatively new, but everything seems to be within normal bounds, and the error messages she's seeing don't indicate anything that could explain the high latency. Meanwhile, Andrew is looking into the payment service, a custom microservice that's instrumented using open telemetry, the new standard for unified metrics, traces, and log data that Splunk is a leader in contributing to. Thankfully, even without having to dig into individual traces, he can see aggregate trends 
in his errors. Andrew notices that most of the errors are from the production environment. He can dig deeper with Tag Spotlight. The power of infinite cardinality allows him to see his requests and errors are distributed by each tag and value, allowing him to identify the root cause and get a feel for the radius of impact. Here, the version points to a problematic deploy and it seems like all tenant levels are affected. Andrew can narrow his investigation to the version of the code and dive deep into a specific trace. With Splunk full fidelity approach, Andrew is confident that he has the end-to-end -end trace when he needs to dig deeper. He notices a trace that's showing some unexpected behavior, so Andrew looks for additional information that has been collected while this is going on. Given that we're using open telemetry, all the metadata he needs to correlate the traces with relevant logs are available. So he simply clicks on the trace ID to look for related logs. In the log view, he sees a number of log lines that are related to the selected trace ID. Upon glancing further, he notices that some of these lines are errors where the message indicates a failed payment attempt, but also notices that the checkout seems to have eventually gone through. Andrew clicks on one of the errors to see the details. What he sees appears instantly suspicious to him. The failed payment message indicates that an API token that is being used is invalid, and also the name of the token is a dead giveaway. It's a test and not a production token. To confirm his hypothesis, Andrew selects the message, adds it to the filter, clears the trace ID, and adds the service by its name so that he can broaden the scope of the data set to include all the logs with that message for the payment service. He then uses visual analytics to group by code version and is able to instantly point to the version v350.10 that is correlated with all the errors that are being seen. By extending the time range and disabling the filters of the error message, Andrew is able to verify that the other versions of code are doing fine. This is because his company does canary pushes only to a subset of transactions to see how new code is doing. Since there's obviously something wrong with this version, Andrew decides to revert the code back to a known good state while he hunts down the right token to use. To confirm that this is all working, he watches the live tail to make sure the failed payment messages present in his logs previously are not making a reappearance. As the code gets rolled back, he sees that the errors die down and the latency for the checkout service goes back to normal levels. Andrew doesn't even have to go to another tool to see this. He gets the notification on his laptop that it has cleared. Okay, so you've seen the demo. I'm sorry, it's kind of a little bit noisy, but Max nowadays are making a lot of noise. So if you hear a sort of background, that's the fan of my laptop. Sorry for that. So if there's anyone for uh, Apple uh, hearing that, please provide feedback to the product managers. <laughs> um, so we've seen um, observability, right? Uh, but observability will help to get the data uh, you need, go for the unknowns, unknowns. Uh, and so on, but once you you there, <coughs> sorry. How can I help the business? And then, and how can I help the business? And how can I help my own DevOps and IT ops teams? Well, you can go to AI ops and business insights. That's the next stage. The idea is extend the visibility, not only to the application, the underlying infrastructure, but also measure directly the impact on the business itself. Because at the end, this is what really matters for all companies, right? Today, this is, again, very difficult because we're working in silos. Um, and inside every silo, we need to deep dive into the details. Um, and so you need to break those silos. You need to get access to the metrics, traces, logs, and so on. That's step number one. But the idea is also not only to have a view, technical view, but how can I have a business view? And that's what also we can do with Splunk, right? In this case, with Splunk uh, Service Intelligence. You can map and, and see your business process from top to down, from a business KPI that can be revenue, checkouts, whatever, down to a single container or whatever, and, and go through all the details 
uh, and see the different correlations. That you can consume it with this service view, or you can also just consume it through what we call a glass table. It's a kind of dashboard. And you can build as many glass tables as you want. There is a, a nice tool so to, you can design your own glass table. And that's a great way to share information with the business, with the service and product teams, uh, and so on. You can see here an example when on the top of this glass table, I have business KPIs. And again, Splunk is a data platform, so we can collect data not only from clouds, containers, and so on, but from IoT, from CRM, from whatever systems you want, as, as, as long as it's machine, machine data. So here I can get directly, if I'm a retailer, for instance, my revenue. Uh, my conversion per channel, if it's my mobile application or my web store that is generating the revenue and, and so on. I can see my customer satisfaction, uh, customer tickets below the overall uh, SLAs. What is the overall e-commerce uh, availability score? So the 100 that you can see, this is a scoring for the availability. And you see a small green dot. That can be a number here we, in this glass table, the owner decided just to show a dot. That's the prediction of the health core of this SLA the next 30 minutes. And I will come back to that later because with artificial intelligence, you can predict the status of an application or a service in the future um, based on the algorithms and, and so on. And, but to get back to this glass table, you have the service levels for manufacturing or shipping and so on. And then below the overall infrastructure with the different components, uh, it's do you select the data you want to see and so on in this glass table. That's a great way to engage with uh, the business and not only see the technical aspect, but see also the business view and the service view. So <clears throat> I keep talking about AI ops. Um, again, observability, you're starting with that, making sure you get everything you need, then you announce monitoring and you go with the investigation. There is a moment where the volume is too big for any human or for any team, and you need artificial intelligence to help you. So when we, what we mean by uh, artificial intelligence, it's mainly machine learning when we talk about DevOps and IT ops. So what is Splunk doing to help? Again, first, any AI ops strategy will fail if you don't have the right data, right? The relevant data. And I rem remind you that there is no equivalent in the market in terms of integrations as the Splunk platform. Getting all the data, it's important. And getting it in, in, in the original raw format also is important because then it means you don't structure the data. That's reduced the amount of uh, maintenance because if you choose to have a huge database and put all this information in there, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a losing battle because every time you need to ask a new question to your data, you need to restructure it. We don't do that at Splunk. At Splunk, the, uh, the structuration of the data is done on the fly, what we call schema on the fly. So it means you can ask any question when you, the only limit is your creativity to ask questions. And that's really important when you're investigating for troubleshooting and so on. So one thing with machine learning, which is really cool, it's clustering and aggregation. The idea here is that to group events that are related together. I have an alert that says um, my web store has an issue. But in fact, I have also an alert that says it's my application server that has an issue. It's saying database is not answering. You have an alert for the database not answering, but the reason is database is saying, I cannot write into the storage. And then storage send another alert saying, I'm full. I have no space available. So basically you're sending alerts to different teams. You're waking up people at 3 a.m. In, in the morning. In fact, they're all related. It's because you don't have storage that the database is uh, in error, then the application server and the front end, right? So with machine learning, Splunk can understand these relations, group them together, and show you what we call one episode. Instead of having 10 different alerts, you get only one episode that says, here is what's happening, and here is also what is directly the root cause. So the idea is to reduce the noise, see the signal, uh, and um, reduce the fatigue for anybody that is working on troubleshooting, right? And also then do the duplication and all this stuff. It's all about reducing the noise and focus on what matters in terms of incident. But then you need to add a context, right? Which of these um, incidents I'm working on is more important? Which one uh, is more impacting uh, my uh, business KPI? Incident number one has an impact on revenue. Incident number two, no. 
maybe incident 91 is the one I should focus on and so on. So adding context is important. So collect extra information to enrich your incident. But then there is the stuff you don't see. And we're talking about observability. It's the anomalies, right? All these things that are hidden in the huge volume of data you need to process, right? Um, it's catching things that the thresholds cannot see. I'll give you some examples. Um, at Splunk, the machine learning will understand the behavior of your application, what it means. You are a trading company. It's 9 a.m. Monday. The markets, the stock exchange is opening. It's no more that your application is at this level of stress, right? It's 90% uh, or whatever. Um, should I send an alert? No, because it's normal. It's Monday morning, right? So the idea is to have to, the thresholds are dynamic and depending on what it's normal, instead of just a basic threshold, say more than five minutes in 90% send an alert, that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, but also finding anomalies is that there's another Monday, 9 a.m., and the, the, the workload is, is really low. That's not normal. And machine learning at Splunk will understand that because again, we understand the normal behavior of the application looking into the past and say every Monday should be at this level, it's below, that's really unusual uh, context. It's not a bank holiday, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I need to trigger an alert because it's the, the level is too low. Someone needs to investigate, right? So all these things that we cannot do because too complicated, too much, it's hidden in the dark. You know, now you can see it because it's at CPU speed that algorithms of machine learning will tell you. Another example, three servers, uh, behind a load balancer. Why the one in the middle is way lower, lower than the others? That's what we call a deviation from the peers. The machine learning will understand that all oh, these three servers are kind of a group. They should have the same workload. One is really different from the others. Maybe it's a misconfiguration, security issue, whatever. I will send an alert. So that's anomaly detection, few examples. And it's really uh, important because it shows you what you don't see usually with classic tools. And then, <coughs> sorry, you have the assisted deep dive investigation. It's all about the root cause analysis. And for the ones that are um, kind of IT oriented, um, it's having incident and problem management at the same time. Basically, the, all the investigation work is done by the machine learning. And think about the example of the episode I just gave you. It's not only you, you identify the incident, but then you can tell what happened and what is the probable root cause. So you save a lot of time in terms of investigation because it's already done. And last but not least, predictive analytics is predicting events. It's predicting the service health. It's forecasting trends and so on. And detect where are the entities that are impacting, in, that will impact your uh, service. How do we do that? Again, processing the data seeing patterns that in the past, those three patterns have created an incident. Now I, I see the same patterns coming again. I will proactively send an alert to the team before it impacts the SLA, before it creates an outage. So um, it's kind of predicting the future based on the past behaviors, basically. That explains why on average our customers are reducing the, high, the number of high priority incidents up to 45%. Why the investigation time, it's reduced by 90% because basically it's done at CPU speed and why we have a huge reduction on business impact. If I dive a little bit quickly on, on some of these examples, predictive, which I think is one of the most interesting parts, basically the way we do it is we define uh, KPIs um, for and, and group them together saying, okay, those KPIs uh, are in fact the ones that are impacting the service health. Um, and then I will start measuring the service uh, and predict the service health. It's a scoring. So for 49, that's not good because ideally it's, you need to be at 100. But then uh, when we send an alert saying there is an issue because the service, we predict that in 30 minutes the, uh, there is a service degradation, we can also tell you directly which KPI in fact um, is the one contributing to this uh, impact. Another interesting aspect of the machine learning is the event analytics, right? Usually when we work with events, we work in silos. It means that all the events for network I send are sent to the network team and so on and so on. 
uh, from containers to cloud ops or whatever. And at the end, when you try to find out what is the real root cause, you just open tickets, tickets are moving around, creating fatigue and tension, and we end up in this war room. The idea of event analytics as Splunk, it's machine learning again, will group and understand the context and group them together and show you those episodes, right? To reduce the noise uh, and see the signal and tell you um, uh, which team to call instead of just having everybody working on the same stuff. And it looks like this, right? This is, for instance, the event analytics uh, view of Splunk. And you can, for instance, see here that there's a number, 11. That means that Splunk had found 11 uh, events that are, in fact, grouped into the same episode and they are related together. So instead of having 11 lines that people need to process, you only have one, and then you click and get all the details. Not only all the details of what happened, but then it will point into the possible root cause and say, there has been a change, maybe a change in configuration that creates all these different aspects. And at the end, it created the incident when you dive into the details. And once you decide to then investigate, and this is one of the really screens and, and parts of the tool that I uh, personally love, because graphically, it will tell you, um, help you to investigate very quickly. So you have a degradation on the service, and you see that there is like a swimming lanes, and you can move the, 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 the mouse, and then you see all the different <clears throat> elements, logs, metric traces into one place, and how they are correlated. And you can really quickly visually see, for instance, that at uh, around uh, 10, 5 p.m., uh, there is a service now change event that happened. And this change, we see the, the degradation on database and, and then on, on the overall service health score and so on. So very quickly, you can troubleshoot with this uh, view in Splunk. So <clears throat> we reaching to the end just quickly for those who are not familiar who we are. So instead of talking about how many countries and, and employees, uh, to be honest, who cares? Um, <laughs> what is important is to understand that what kind of markets we are serving. The first one is because, again, think about Splunk is a data platform with different use cases. One of them is ITOM, IT operations management. Um, so when you when you are an ITOM tool, basically you help to manage provision capacity and performance and the availability of your infrastructure. We also are an APM tool. Well, again, think as a Lego brick. We have a Lego APM, or we can connect to your existing APM, but we have one, which is pretty cool, uh, for uh, seeing what's going on, not only on the infrastructure with the item, but on the application and code and transaction part with APM. We also are an ITOA tool, IT operations analytics, which is a tool that helps you take the best decisions because uh, the idea is to analyze and interpret the data to guide decisions. Because again, volumes, complexity of application and infrastructure now need help. And help can also be artificial intelligence. And for that, as defined by Garner, we are an AI ops solution as well, artificial intelligence for IT operations, which is basically when you have big data, you apply machine learning and orchestration, then you, you are an AIOps uh, player, which what I call is acceleration. Use machine learning to accelerate your capacity to see what's going on, to accelerate your decision process. And because we see everything, we help with security, obviously, and we are a seen tool. And in all these different markets, in most of them, we are the global leader. ITOA, ITOM, SIM, Splunk is leading in market share and growth. We just entered the APM, but we directly went into Visionary in the Magic Quadrant for, for the first uh, time. And we are among the leaders of AIOps. Might sound a little bit complex, so Gardner decided to group some of these market segments into a bigger one called Performance Analysis. And for the first time, um, they created this big market. And Splunk is, again, number one in market share and in growth. So in terms of customers, we're addressing any size of customer, any vertical. You see some examples here in terms of logos. There is one example that I really love, which is Black Friday, Dell. Uh, imagine how important and the volume of revenue that generates a Black Friday for Dell uh, online. The issues they had is a classic that many companies have, disjoint data sets. 
working in silos with silo tools having a high mean time to repair and then at the end maybe a negative i mean not ne maybe <laughs> negative customer experience they adopted splunk and the first year they adopted splunk they had zero downtime during black friday record sales record high customer satisfaction and maybe one of the best quotes i have from a customer uh, from the senior director of uh, site reliability engineer for for dell it's the best black friday ever so thank you for uh, attending and um, see you soon in devops.com for another webinar. All right, great. So as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, we are not going to be doing a live question and answer period during this webinar, but if you do have a question for Stefan or anybody else over at Splunk, um, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. We'll make sure that the folks at Splunk get a copy of all of the questions that come in. I also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So uh, if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email to access the webinar on demand. Um, we're also going to have the webinar on, I believe it's actually going to be on the Security Boulevard website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, also at the top of the hour, I did note that we would be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So let's go ahead and do that now. Our first winner today is Greg F. Congratulations, Greg. Second winner today is John K. Congratulations, John. Third winner today is Maria G. Congratulations, Maria. And our final winner today is Tom L. Congratulations, Tom. We'll be following up with all four of you offline by email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. If you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Uh, I do want to thank the folks at Splunk for today's webinar. Lots of great information. Love to see the demos as well. Those are always lots of fun. So uh, thank you to Splunk for today's webinar and a big thank you to our audience for joining us today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe.